In this video, we will learn about constructing an interaction diagram for a reinforced concrete cross-section. You can see here on the screen, I have drawn an interaction diagram. And so we have P sub N on the vertical axis and M sub N on the horizontal axis. And for a given cross-section and reinforcement, uh, we will be able to calculate this curve here, which is the interaction diagram for the column. And there are some regions on this interaction diagram. Uh, there is a compression failure range, and it is this upper region here between 1 and 3. And then there is a tension failure range, which is between 2 and 3. And that boundary that is between those two is called the balanced failure condition. Uh, and we learned about that previously for reinforced concrete beams. And so at that location, the values are P sub B for the axial force and M sub B for the moment. At point two, this is the point that is just like a reinforced concrete beam with no axial load. And so for a reinforced concrete cross section, you should know how to calculate that point already. And that is called M0. And then we also have uh, the maximum value on the interaction diagram. Uh, which theoretically can be calculated, which is P0. So one of the things that we're going to do in this tutorial is learn how to calculate points 1, 2, 3, and 4. And so we can see that an interaction diagram may be constructed by determining points 1 through 3 and then finding many of the other points on the interaction diagram curve. One such point is point 4. So many point f points like point 4 will eventually fill in the rest of the curve. But 4 is just an example of one of them. Uh, in the following pages below, the method of determining each of these points is presented. So if we consider a reinforced concrete cross-section, we can see that here. And we are going to be bending about a vertical axis right here. And uh, we can see that there are one, two, three, four layers of steel in this example. And in this case, I have H oriented horizontally. And H over 2, of course, then would be to the center of that beam cross section. And we also have a width for that beam, which in this picture is actually a vertical distance. And that width is B. That is the typical value of B that we have used in beam design. And then we can imagine here that uh, this, of course, was a cross section. This now is a side view of the column. And so we can see that on this upper edge, which is the cross section, uh, we are going to be applying an axial force at some eccentricity, uh, which is really the combination of an axial force and a moment. And so we are going to calculate Pn and Mn in, by using the formulas that we derive. Now, this picture here is just illustrating the strain profile. And it's similar to what you've seen for beams. We have our ultimate strain in the concrete. And then we have a steel strain at each layer of steel. So we see epsilon sub s1 all the way up to epsilon sub s4. We also have the dimensions to each of these layers of steel. We have d1 through d4 and that those are all measured from the compression edge of the concrete. We also have our distance to the neutral axis. 
our distance c. We also can draw our stress profile. And so we have uh, indicated all of these various stresses along the cross section. Of course, there is the uh, Whitney stress block for the uh, compression stress in the concrete. And we also have each one of the steel stresses indicated, F sub S1 through F sub S4. With those drawings in hand, we can write equations that are very similar to what we did before for reinforced concrete beams. The only thing that will be different is that we will have in our force equilibrium um, equations, we will have this additional term, which is P sub N. Previously, we just had forces due to the steel and the concrete, but now we have an external force, which is becomes an internal axial force, P sub N, and that will have to be included in our uh, force equilibrium equation, and we're going to see that next. So force equilibrium requires that we have uh, negative Pn. And so in our previous picture, downwards is negative. And then so we have negative Pn plus all of the forces in the steel bars. And I am indicating those as T sub Si. And they are equal to the steel stress times the area of each bar or each layer's uh, total area of steel. And so that's the sum of all of those uh, steel layers. And of course, the signs are taken care of in our definition of strain and stress. Uh, and we'll see that down below. And it's just the same as the way that we defined it for a reinforced concrete beam. The other uh, force that we have is our concrete compressive stress and that uh, or compressive force and it is being caused by this compressive stress here and it is acting upwards and so it will be positive so adding all of those up and setting them equal to zero is our summation of forces equilibrium equation if we solve for pn we would get this expression which is equation i this expression here is identical to the one that we found for reinforced concrete beams, except that instead of this being set equal to zero, it is set now equal to Pn because of that additional force. That's the only difference. Now, we have all of these terms. Uh, we do need to re-emphasize how it is that we calculate some of these variables. And uh, these things are calculated just the same way that we did for reinforced concrete beams. We have that our strain at each level i is equal to C minus di over C times epsilon u. And in this case, the way that this formula has been constructed, it will turn out that epsilon sub Si is negative for steel intention. So steel that is below the neutral axis will have a negative strain. We can also then from that strain calculate the stress in each layer of steel and we do that based on Hooke's law saying that stress is equal to the modulus times the strain and from that steel stress we can multiply it times the area of the layer I and we get T sub SI. Now T sub I has some restrictions on it um, well actually it's F sub I has some restrictions because uh, we can't exceed yield and we also have to account for uh, the concrete that is displaced by uh, rebar in the compression region and so uh, we have some restrictions so the above formulas here are true 
but they have the following restrictions which are applied in the following order. If f sub si, that is the absolute value of f sub si, is greater than f sub y, which we do not allow, we assume our maximum steel stress value is Fy. If it's greater than Fy, we need to, um, and, and that would be greater than Fy as calculated by this Hooke's Law formula. Um, if that value turns out greater than F sub Y, then we would recalculate it here uh, using this formula. And basically all this does is it takes the sign of F sub SI and makes this either a 1 or a negative 1 uh, and multiplies it times F sub Y so that F sub Y has the correct sign and now that layer I has the correct stress value. If F sub SI is greater than 0 it indicates that we're in the compression zone and hence we must subtract out uh, the concrete compressive stress that would be acting on concrete if it was there but it is not present at a particular uh, bar of steel or steel layer and so we subtract out that concrete stress that would be um, applied at those locations but is not there so we subtract that out just like we did for reinforced concrete beams with compression reinforcement. The last thing that we do is we apply our e uh, um, moment equilibrium equation and so in this case we are going to sum moments about the center line of the beam. So if you remember this picture up here we have the center of the beam which is at h over 2 and we're going to be summing moments about that location. If we do that, we are going to get negative Pn times E. We're going to get the sum of the steel forces times their moment arms. And we're also going to get the concrete compressive force times its moment arm. And if you look at the geometry, uh, you would be able to um, find how each of these terms make sense, uh, particularly uh, these moment arm distances. That just comes about from the geometry of the cross section and our assumptions. The additional term here of course is equal to Pn times E and that is really just equal to uh, Mn. So now once we have this expression we can solve for Pne or Mn and it will be equal to the remaining portion of the equation. So this then is our final expression for Mn um, due to our moment equilibrium equation. And this is what I am calling equation double I. With those two formulas in hand, I and double I, which we will refer to later, we can calculate Pn and Mn for any given value of C. So if we know a value of C, we can automatically calculate a point on our interaction diagram. And so you don't have to uh, numerically figure out some value of C. We are actually going to be able to just plug in values and get pairs of MN and PN coordinates. So recall uh, from our original picture here we have point one and that's the first one that we're going to find. So right here we have a discussion about finding point one. To determine point one we may use equation I However, since the whole cross-section is under compression, the term that is 0.85 F sub C prime beta 1 C times B changes to the following, 
where the part that's modified is the beta 1c. Since the whole cross section is in, is in compression at point 1, that is to say it's under uh, axial force but no moment, beta 1c will just be the full depth of the beam which is h. And we also can uh, that then is 0.85 f sub c prime times the gross cross-sectional area and that actually should be changed to 0.85 f sub c prime times the gross cross-sectional area minus the areas of steel because those areas of steel are uh, going to be multiplied by um, steel stresses not concrete stresses. So this is the expression for the concrete contribution. And then we have the axial load resisted by the steel is the sum of the F sub SI times the ASI. Um, but that has to change to the sum of the F sub Y times A sub SI. And that is because at our maximum axial capacity we're assuming that the bars have yielded and so we've just changed F sub SI to F sub Y. From that then we have this formula for P0 and MN equals 0 at point 1 on our interaction diagram. In order to calculate point 2, which you'll recall is right down here, we can uh, remember that uh, to determine point 2 we must first use equation I and set PN equals to 0. The value of C that satisfies the equation is then used in equation double I to determine MN. So this is describing exactly the same situation that you had with reinforced concrete beams that we have already learned about. Uh, this is as if your column is acting as a beam and it probably has some compression reinforcement and so the procedures for compression reinforced beams would be something you would have to consider and you would be able to find PN equals zero at point two and we would find the corresponding value of MN for the correct value of C, which you would have to determine. Next, we have point number three, which is right here, and that is the balanced condition. And so then there is going to be a value of C, which is called C sub B for this location. And we can calculate that C sub B and uh, it is right here if we look at this picture we can imagine that at the ultimate when we are at the ultimate strain in the concrete and we are simultaneously at the yield strain for the steel at the outermost steel layer we can say that we have uh, D max which is the distance from the compression face to the outermost layer of steel. And we also have CB, it's the distance from epsilon U down to the neutral axis, and that is the balanced C. And then this distance from the neutral axis to epsilon Y then is D max minus C sub B. So then, using similar triangles, we have C sub B over epsilon U is equal to D max minus CB over epsilon Y. Well, from this expression, we can see CB is on each side, and we really need to solve for CB. And so if you go through the algebra of doing that, you finally will come to this expression here, which is that C sub B is equal to epsilon U over epsilon U plus epsilon Y, all of that times D max. Putting this value of CB into equations I and double I will yield the values of P sub B and M sub B respectively and that will be your coordinates for point 3. Finally, 
we have 0.4. And this is just any 0.4, which could be any of the points along the curve that are not 1, 2, or 3. And we can now describe how to find that case, 0.4. To determine 0.4 in the compression failure range, one merely must select a value of C such that C is greater than C sub B and C is less than H over beta 1. Now I'm indicating here H over beta 1 uh, just because it turns out that at the upper portion of our interaction diagram we can get a more complete curve if we consider values all the way up to H over beta 1. And so that's my suggestion for your upper limit on C in that rate region. Uh, once we select a value of C in that compression failure range, then we can use equations I and double I and we can determine a point 4 for that range. And we could plot it. Uh, to help construct our interaction diagram. To determine point 0.4 in the tension failure range, one merely must select a value of C such that C is greater than 0 but less than C sub B. Then use equations I and double I. Uh, the values determined for point 0.4 will be the values of Pn and Mn on the interaction curve for the value of C selected. The values of Pn and, and Mn so determined above will co correspond to a specific eccentricity E also. And the value of E for each of those cases can be calculated as Mn over Pn. Uh, this is uh, sometimes useful, but most of the time we don't really need to do this. But there are some interesting cases that we can consider for um, E. And so I've, I've listed some of these down here just to give you some examples. For instance, at point 1, we have E equal to MN over P0. But MN for this case is 0, so we have 0 over P0 equals 0. So with no eccentricity, C is theoretically infinite. For point 2, we have E equal to M0 over Pn. And so Pn is 0 for this case. We have M0 over 0. And so then uh, E is theoretically infinite. And C corresponds to uh, rectangular beam design, the case when MN is determined with no axial load. We also have point 3, which is the balanced eccentricity. So we would have MB over P sub B, and in this case C equals C sub B, which we calculated or we derived a formula for point 3. Uh, we derived the formula for C sub B. And then for any point 4, E is just equal to Mn over Pn, and C is just that unique value for those sets of Mn and Pn values. Now that we have covered uh, all of this information about constructing an interaction diagram, uh, we can show you an example now of what takes place when you construct that interaction diagram. Well, so far we've only shown the formulas for Pn and Mn, and if you use those, you're going to plot all these values here, and you would get this interaction diagram curve. You can see that there are positive axial forces up here, and that indicates uh, cases for which uh, the concrete column cross-section is in compression. Uh, the, if you calculate all the values down to H, or I should say C equals 0, you're going to get some indication here of uh, Pn values that are negative, And that indicates that the cross-section is in tension. 
if we also include phi factors correctly, we will then get this inner interaction diagram. And that is really the one that we would use for design. And you can see here that there's actually a little bit of a kink here in our interaction diagram. And this is just the region in which we're having it trans, uh, it, it's changing, I should say, from uh, the compression zone type failure to a tension zone type failure. And so you know from beam design that that phi factor varies in this region. And so there's actually uh, this, uh, you're gonna have to calculate epsilon t and be able to use the correct phi factor at different locations, particularly in this region along the interaction diagram. Uh, you'll also notice that we have a phi pn max. And so our interaction diagram really has a maximum value indicated by this horizontal line here, and that's the cutoff point. So we can't use a phi pn value greater than that. And in one of your previous lectures, we talked about how to calculate phi pn max. Otherwise, you would be able to look in your textbook and it would explain this term also. For this particular example, I have uh, indicated the concrete cross-section and the information that I used uh, for that concrete cross-section in order to construct this interaction diagram. And so when you uh, create your MATLAB script that you're supposed to do, you can, uh, once it's uh, beginning to work, you can run this example also and compare it to this uh, interaction diagram and see whether or not you are getting uh, it to look correct. So those are uh, just um, the beginning pieces of information that will help you get on your way to constructing your interaction diagram MATLAB script or computer program. Uh, and I also have some suggestions about that that I want to point out to you. So here are some things to remember and some suggestions for your computer program. One, be sure to calculate beta 1 based on f sub c prime. Two, calculate phi based on epsilon t. So you'll want to use that formula that I have given to you previously and make sure that you use the correct phi factor. Now that formula for phi is exactly the same one that we used for beam design. Uh, it is also applicable in this situation. And lastly, item three here. This is just kind of a rough outline of how I suggest you should go about uh, constructing your computer program to construct interaction diagrams. What I suggest is that you choose a single value of C and uh, have the ability in your computer program to just give it a single value of C and then calculate phi MN and phi PN. And it probably would be a good idea to do that for the case of C sub B. If you can get that to work, then you're probably going to have all of your other values of C work out. So I would recommend that you first make sure that you know how to give it a single value of C and that you calculate the correct phi MN and phi PN values. You can then compare that to the example that I just told you about and you can also look at my interaction program's output for other C, phi MN, phi PN combinations if you want to try other test values of C and corresponding phi MN, phi PN values. Once you know that your calculations for phi MN and phi PN are working properly, you can then try um, 
to do a for loop for all values of c between 0 and h over beta 1 and you can plot the result and you should start to get your interaction diagram. Well, I hope that helps and this is your first step towards learning about constructing your very own interaction diagrams for reinforced concrete columns.